And I want you to know what the object of his love is. His love is measured by the gift, which is the gift of his son. But, but it's also measured, if you look, it says that God loved the world so much, or God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What is the object of his love in that phrase? It's the world. It's, who is it that God loves? It's the world. Now let me shed some light on this for just a moment. Because this verse, I believe, has been wrongly used in debates throughout the centuries. Because people look at the word world and they say, well, God loves us so much that his love expands out to the entire world. And we look at the world as a term of quantity. How much does God love us? He loves us so much that his love includes all of the world. Calvinists and non-Calvinists alike like to use this verse. Some of us might say, well, God loves the world in the sense that his love doesn't only extend to the Jews, it also extends to the Gentiles. While there are other ones that say, no, God's love for the world means that he loves every individual in the world. But both of those interpretations, I think, and I think along with B.B. Warfield, who said this much longer before I did, but I think those miss the mark of what John is talking about. Because if you read throughout John's writings, whenever he uses the term world, he's not using it to describe the vastness of something. He's not using it to describe the expansiveness of something. He's using it to describe uh, the depth of the sin which is included in it. In 1 John chapter 2, he describes that which is in the world not as numbers of people, but as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what John looks at as the world. The world, to John, is not so much about how wide it is. It's more about how bad it is. And whenever the Bible says that God so loved the world, it's not saying that God loved the world so much that he included this much. It's saying that God had loved the world so much that he stooped down this love. That God loved that which was wicked. He loved that which was bad. He loves that which by its very nature would not ever love him back. And that's the quality of God's love. The word world here is a, is a term of quality, not quantity. God loved the world so much, not necessarily that he included a certain number. Well, he did include a certain number. But the idea is that he bent down so low. He, he grabbed a, a people unto himself that were stooped so deep in sin that there was no way they could ever pull themselves out. And that's how much God loves the world. It is not so great because he loves so many, although that makes it great too. But John's point here is that God's love is so great because it extends to those who are so bad. God so loved the world. He loved those that could never love Him back. And for those of you who have experienced the grace of God and who have, who have embraced this gift that He has given us in Christ Jesus, you might ask, well, how much does God love me? And the answer is this. Paul answers it for us in Romans chapter 5, doesn't he? Well, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. God demonstrated. God showed His love in this. In what? How did God show His love? In that while we were sinners, we were people who hated God. We were people who had mocked the glory of God by the way that we lived that could never come before Him. And while we were still in that state, Christ died for us. It's one thing to die for someone, isn't it? It's another thing to die for someone who hates you. It's one thing to die for someone that you love, that loves you back. It's another thing to die for someone that can't stand you. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ still died for us. Now, I may not have done it that way if I were God. Maybe you say, I wouldn't have done it that way if I were God. Well... I'm glad you're not God. And I'm glad I'm not God. 
Because God's way is the best way. And God's motivation for giving the greatest gift that has ever been given is a love so vast, so wide, so deep that penetrates to the very depth of the human soul, the very uh, corruption that exists within us. And yet God loved so much that He still sent His Son in spite of the fact that we were so bad. But the question still remains, why, doesn't it? We know that He was motivated by love, but why would God do this? Why would God... Uh, cast his affections on people in such a way that he would send his son to die. And the purpose of that is indicated in the final half of this verse. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did God send his son into the world? So that for this reason the very purpose for which God gave His Son is that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why did God give? Well, first of all, so that people would not perish. You realize that is the fate that awaits the person who does not embrace the gift of God in Jesus Christ. You realize that, that there are only Two options. There's everlasting life or there is to perish. Which one is it going to be? We don't have a multitude of options here. We're either in one camp or the other. There's two groups of people. There are those who experience everlasting life. And there's not simply another group called those who don't. Those who don't are in the group of people who actually perish. To perish doesn't mean simply to die and just be done away with. It doesn't mean to just kind of pass on into some other eternal dimension. The word perish means to suffer, to experience eternal torment in the fires of hell. The word perish means to experience the very wrath of God for all of eternity. It's the very worst thing that you could possibly imagine, and even then, you could not imagine it. And that is the fate that awaits those who do not embrace this gift in Jesus Christ. They will perish. There are those who perish, and there are those, the Bible says, that have everlasting life. The difference between the two is simple. It is one of belief. Notice what the Bible says. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? It certainly doesn't mean to recognize that He came into the world. It doesn't mean to have a mere recognition of the fact that He died on the cross to save sinners. It means to embrace Jesus for who He is. It means to trust Him like you have never trusted anything before. To rest in His grace knowing that it is He and He alone that can save you. Here very recently, uh, Jerry Murphy had heart surgery. All of you know that. And before he had the surgery that he went through, he was told that there's a chance that he may not make it through that surgery. And... I know that Jerry went into the surgery with a good attitude because I talked to him about it. And I know that Jerry trusted the Lord. When, whenever he went into that surgery, he had to trust what the Lord would do through those doctors, didn't he? He said, Doctor, I don't know what's going on with my heart. I don't know how to explain it. But I have to trust you with my life as you take me in there and cut me over. And friends, that's what faith is all about. It's saying, God, I don't know the answers. I don't know how to save myself. I don't know how to go about my life apart from you. But I'm trusting you, Jesus. You are the one who alone can save me. You are the one who can help me escape an eternity in hell, although there's nothing that I can do on my own. You are the one who can give me life and give it abundantly. You are the one who alone is worthy to be praised, not me, Jesus. 
That's what belief is all about. It's not simply recognizing because James says even the demons believe and they tremble. But those who believe, those who rest in Christ Jesus are not the ones that perish. Those are the ones that have everlasting life. This is precisely the group for whom God gave the greatest gift that was ever given. He gave the gift for those who believe. I want you to see that. Christ did not die to save every soul in creation. Yes, I'm saying that. He did not die to save every soul in creation. The Bible says He died to save those who believe. He did not die to save those who did not believe in Him. Christ died not to save people who continue to mock His glory until the day that, he, that they died. He did not die so that people who never turn to Him in repentance and faith will experience the joys of heaven. He died for a group of people. And you ask, who are those people? It is those who believe. And my question for you this morning, as we celebrate Christmas this year, are you one of those who believe? You know the beauty of this passage? Is that it doesn't speak to any particular kind of person, does it? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're in preschool. It doesn't matter if you've got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana field, so to speak. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. It doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible. It doesn't matter how much you have understood before about the character of God. What matters is that you believe. And the question is, as we celebrate Christmas, are you one of those who believes? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful that you have loved us the way that you have. Lord, we know that there is nothing in us that deserves your mercy. There is nothing in us that deserves your grace. We do not deserve to walk in your presence, to experience the joys of heaven, to experience fellowship and communion with you. Oh, Lord, but you have loved us sinful enough to send your son to die for those who trust in him. Father, I pray today that you might speak to the hearts of every person in this room. Lord, and I know that there are people here today who trust in their works. They trust in the good things that they do. They trust in, in all of the righteous deeds and the prayers that they have prayed. And Lord, I pray this morning that you might turn their heart to trust in you and in you alone. Lord, I pray this morning that we not only recognize that Jesus Christ was the greatest gift that has ever been given to the human race. Lord, I pray that we also recognize why this gift is so special and so sacred. Lord, I pray that you will speak to your people today and that you will encourage us all about the love of the God that we serve. And Lord, I pray that you will convict those who don't believe so their hearts might be turned towards Jesus Christ so that they may not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I know this verse is a common verse. But Lord, I pray that we understand it today.